on World News Tonight. London on high alert. Buckingham Palace releases the list of dignitaries who will attend His Majesty's coronation as security is heightened all over the British capital. Strategic cooperation. China and Myanmar agree to promote comprehensive strategic cooperation to lower tension in the geopolitical area. Threat to humanity. The godfather of artificial intelligence resigns from Google, saying he now regretted his work which might threaten humanity in the future. Travel through time. Immersive tourist attractions in Xi'an enable visitors to travel through the Tang Dynasty. This is Adaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and you are watching World News. Now in a few days time, the world will witness an iconic moment in history. On the 6th of May, the coronation ceremony for King Charles III will take place in London, the first event of its kind in 70 years. A host of foreign royals and heads of state are expected to attend with festivities to continue across the country over the long weekend. The last coronation of a member of the British royal family was 70 years ago, when then 27-year-old Queen Elizabeth II began her reign. And on Saturday, the ancient ritual will take place again for the coronation of King Charles III and the crowning of his wife, Queen Consort Camilla. King Charles becomes the oldest to accede to the throne at the age of 73 years. Taking charge of the ceremony at Westminster Abbey will be the Archbishop of Canterbury. Some 2,000 guests have been invited, including foreign royals and heads of state. The king has opted for a smaller, shorter and more diverse ceremony than for his mother's coronation in 1953. The festivities will last all weekend, running into Monday, which has been proclaimed a public holiday nationwide. Events include colorful parades, public concerts, spectacular light shows and thousands of street parties across the UK and the Commonwealth. Among the guests, British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is due to attend, alongside cabinet ministers and peers from the House of Lords, and former UK Prime Ministers like Theresa May and Tony Blair. US President Joe Biden will not be attending himself, but has confirmed that First Lady Jill Biden will take his place. It is also understood that religious leaders and representatives from across the Commonwealth will attend. Critics have questioned the cost of the lavish coronation at a time when the public is facing economic hardship and struggling with a cost-of-living crisis. To this, a palace spokesperson pointed to reports that more than £1 billion, that's roughly $1.25 billion U.S. dollars, was expected to flow into the struggling economy on the back of the event. And having so many heads of state present was also a huge networking opportunity. Security concerns are raising just days before the coronation of King Charles III. Now, London's Metropolitan Police arrested a man outside Buckingham Palace after he allegedly threw suspected shotgun cartridges into the palace grounds. Just days before King Charles's coronation, a man has been arrested after throwing suspected shotgun cartridges into the grounds of Buckingham Palace. Police said the suspect approached the King's London residence on Tuesday and threw the items before being detained by officers. Police also carried out a controlled explosion in the area. Neither the King nor his wife Camilla were at the palace at the time of the incident. London's Metropolitan Police said in a statement, quote, The man has been arrested on suspicion of possession of an offensive weapon after he was searched and a knife was found. The statement said police were not currently treating the matter as related to terrorism. As Coronation Day approaches, the UK's security services are on high alert. Saturday's event is expected to see large crowds line the streets of London and heads of state from around the world attend the formal ceremony. China's foreign minister has met Myanmar's top general hailing the friendship between the two nations and pledging to boost ties as violence escalates in the Southeast Asian country two years after a military coup. 
At a meeting with Myanmar leader Ming Ong Lai in the Myanmar capital, Chinese State Councillor and Foreign Minister Ching Gang said China has attached great importance to its relations with Myanmar, as the two neighbors share fraternal friendship. Ching Gang said China is ready to join hands with Myanmar to build a China-Myanmar community with a shared future and take the lead to implement the Global Development Initiative. the Global Security Initiative and Global Civilization Initiative. China supports Myanmar in advancing its political transition process and backs relevant parties in the country to properly address differences and seek national reconciliation with the constitutional and legal framework. The international community should respect Myanmar's sovereignty and play a constructive role in helping Myanmar achieve peace and reconciliation. The Chinese side will continue to do what is in its power to help Myanmar in its development efforts, accelerate key cooperation projects of China-Myanmar Economic Corridor and implement projects on agriculture, education and healthcare among others for the benefit of Myanmar people. Myanmar is willing to work with China to further enhance Myanmar-China friendship and cooperation and actively build a Myanmar-China community with a shared future. The Myanmar leader noted that Myanmar attaches great importance to protecting the safety of Chinese nationals and institutions in the country and is always ready to cooperate with the Chinese side to maintain tranquility in the border areas of the two countries. During his visit, Chin also met with former chairman of the Myanmar State Peace and Development Council, Tan Shui. and Union Minister for Foreign Affairs Tan Sui. On the outcomes by President Yoon Suk-yeol's state visit to the United States, the impacts of the technological alliance between South Korea and the United States formed during the president's stay in Washington is suspected to spread across many different sectors. One of the key outcomes of President Yoon's official visit to Washington last week was the technological alliance established between South Korea and the United States, particularly in terms of its economic impacts. President Yoon expressed his thoughts on the alliance in a cabinet meeting on Tuesday. The business roundtables and events held during President Yoon's stay resulted in 50 MOU partnerships and a total of 5.9 billion US dollars worth of investment in South Korea. Six tech firms in clean hydrogen and chips announced a 1.9 billion dollar investment to build factories in the country, and multinational materials tech company Corning Incorporated will be investing 1.5 billion dollars over the next five years. With Korean firms such as Samsung SDI and LG Energy Solution to build electric vehicle battery plants in the US too, it's expected that this technological alliance will help tackle the supply chain crisis as well as creating more job opportunities. In addition to the series of investments, the bilateral summit also led to the formation of a special exchange initiative for students majoring in STEM subjects in South Korea and the US, those being science, technology, engineering and mathematics. The two countries will invest a total of $60 million to support international exchanges to foster talent. This is in line with the agreement to establish a dialogue between the U.S. National Security Council and the Korea Office of National Security to promote joint research and development and expert exchange in the chips, batteries, biotechnology and quantum science fields. Another outcome is the extension of the Mutual Defense Treaty to cyberspace and outer space. A bilateral defense agreement that establishes the commitment of the U.S. and South Korea to provide mutual defense support in case of an attack from a third party. The Strategic Cybersecurity Cooperation Framework enables the sharing of information and technology, as well as cooperation in strategy and policies to prevent cyber crimes. As for the Space Alliance, South Korea's Minister of Science and ICT and the Deputy Administrator of NASA signed a pact to strengthen joint research and development in areas of space telecommunications and lunar exploration. An Islamic Jihad leader died in Israeli custody after 87-day hunger strike, the first such fatality in more than three decades. A few hours after his death, Palestinian militants fired rockets for Gaza into southern Israel. Fighting has escalated over the death of a Palestinian hunger striker in Israeli custody. Late Tuesday, militants in the Gaza Strip fired salvos of rockets into Israel. In response, Israeli planes struck Gaza City. The Israeli military says it hit weapons manufacturing sites and training camps of Hamas, the Islamic group that governs the coastal enclave. Tensions flared after Qada Adnan, a prominent Islamic Jihad member detained in Israel, died Tuesday after he refused food for almost three months. He's the first Palestinian hunger striker to die in Israeli custody in more than 30 years. 
Israel's prison service says Adnan, who was awaiting trial, refused medical care. Disputing their claim, Adnan's lawyer accused Israeli authorities of withholding treatment. <laughs> News of Qadr's death spread anger among Palestinians. The Islamic Jihad has sworn revenge on Qadr's death, but Qadr's wife has appealed for calm from resistance groups and said she doesn't want to see bloodshed. According to the Palestinian Prisoners Association, Adnan had been arrested by Israel 12 times. Washington's State Department Deputy Spokesman Vedant Patel commented at a Tuesday briefing saying all individuals, including prisoners, should be treated humanely. That is our belief. That is our view. He also noted the Palestinian Islamic Jihad is a designated foreign terrorist organization that continues to advance violence. Going into a short commercial break now, more news on the other side. Welcome back. Now, U.S. President Joe Biden's administration will temporarily send 1,500 additional troops to help secure the U.S.-Mexico border in preparation for a possible rise in illegal immigration when COVID-19 border restrictions lift later this month. With experts anticipating a huge surge in migrants this month coming to the U.S., President Joe Biden's administration said Tuesday it will temporarily send 1,500 troops to help secure the U.S.-Mexico border. Pentagon spokesman Pat Ryder. For 90 days, these 1,500 military personnel who will be sourced from the active duty component will fill critical capability gaps, such as ground-based detection and monitoring, data entry, and warehouse support until CPB can address these needs through contracted support. Military personnel will not directly participate in law enforcement activities. The increase in border resources, adding to the 2,500 National Guard troops already there, comes as Trump-era COVID-19 restrictions, known as Title 42, are set to end on May 11th. The policy had allowed U.S. authorities to rapidly expel non-Mexican migrants to Mexico without the chance to seek asylum. Biden, who is running for re-election, already has grappled with record numbers of migrants caught illegally crossing the border during his tenure, and has taken criticism from all sides. Republicans have blasted Biden for rolling back Trump's hardline policies, while Democrats and immigration activists have lashed out over what they see as Biden's toughening approach to border security. Still, Reuters national security correspondent Idris Ali says the border deployment comes with some reservations within the Pentagon. U.S. military troops have been used to help secure the border during previous administrations, including under President Bush and Obama. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre on Tuesday went so far as to call such deployments a common practice. But some in the president's own party were not on board. Senator Bob Menendez, a Democrat and chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, said Biden's decision to send troops to the border was unacceptable and accused the president of trying to score political points. Over to an update on the war in Ukraine, another freight train derailed by a blast in the Russian city of Bryansk. In a region bordering Ukraine, Russian officials say the pro-Ukrainian subdash groups were behind the attack. An explosion derailed a freight train on Tuesday in the Russian city of Bryansk, which borders Ukraine. The latest incident marks the second straight day that a Russian freight train has been derailed. According to the Bryansk regional governor, an unidentified explosive device went off near the Shneshchikaya rail station, causing a locomotive and several wagons to derail. Although he made no mention of who may have been responsible, other Russian officials blame the recent derailments on pro-Ukrainian sabotage groups who they say have been behind multiple attacks in the border region since Russia invaded Ukraine in February 2022. Meanwhile, Russian media is reporting that Ukraine, which is preparing for a major springtime counteroffensive, may also carry out terrorist attacks in major cities in Russia and border areas with Ukraine to coincide with Russia's Victory Day celebrations on May 9th. According to the Russian Daily MK on Tuesday, Russian military experts have warned that Ukraine could launch small but devastating terrorist attacks on Russian cities before a major offensive. In the meantime, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said Tuesday that with China trying to mediate peace talks between Russia and Ukraine, Beijing must first recognize Ukraine's territorial sovereignty and independence. 
During the Fox News interview, Blinken also stressed that dialogue with the people of Ukraine is also important as they are the real victims of the prolonged war. The top U.S. diplomat also noted that a Ukrainian counteroffensive may happen soon, adding that success on the battlefield is the best and fastest way to arrive at negotiations that will create a just and lasting peace. A man widely seen as the godfather of artificial intelligence has quit his job, warning about the growing dangers from developing in developments in the field. George Hilton uh, announcing his resignation from Google in a statement to U.S. media saying that he now regretted his work. It's technology that could be superior to the human brain. And one of its pioneers now says part of him regrets his role in creating it. 75-year-old computer scientist Jeffrey Hinton says he quit his job at Google so he can independently share his concerns about AI technology, which include fears over disinformation and stealing human jobs, but also go far beyond that. What do we do to mitigate the long-term risks of um, things more intelligent than us taking mm. control? Things like GPT-4 eclipses a person in the amount of general knowledge it has and eclipses them by a long way. Um, in terms of reasoning, it's not as good, but it does already do simple reasoning. And given the rate of progress, we expect things to get better quite fast. So we need to worry about that. It's just the latest warning that tech companies might be creating a monster they can't control. In March, after OpenAI released the latest model of its chatbot, GBT4, more than 1,000 people from the tech industry, including billionaire Elon Musk and Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak, signed a letter calling for a moratorium on AI development. Hinton also called for developers to hit pause, and Google's chief scientist responded to his interviews in a statement. We remain committed to a responsible approach to AI. We are continually learning to understand emerging risks while also innovating boldly. Hinton himself said Google has so far acted as a proper steward for the technology, but is coming under increasing pressure from competition. He warns that tech giants are trapped in a race that will require global regulation to stop. Groups of Korean doctors and nursing assistants are going on a partial strike today. They are calling for a presidential veto of the Nursing Act that gives nurses more independence. A total of 13 associations of doctors and nursing assistants in South Korea are going on a partial strike on Wednesday. They are protesting against a Nursing Act which is aimed at giving nurses more independence in their duties. Members of groups like the Korea Medical Association and the Korean Licensed Practical Nurses Association are calling on President Yoon song yeol to veto the bill. They are working shortened hours and using their annual leave to take part in rallies across the country in the afternoon. They have warned of a second partial strike on May 11th and later a general strike if the president does not veto the bill. If our request isn't accepted despite this much resistance, we will carry out a 4 million person strong general strike on the 17th. Partial strikes are being carried out by members of local clinics on a voluntary basis to minimize inconvenience to patients. The general strike will also involve members of larger university hospitals. Last week, the opposition-controlled National Assembly passed a nursing act despite strong opposition from the ruling bloc. The act seeks to improve nurses' working conditions by defining their roles and duties separately from the Medical Service Act, which puts them, quote, under the guidance of physicians. It also defines the duties of nurses and nursing assistants separately. Doctors see it as an intrusion of their duties, while nursing assistants are concerned about being left out by the act. Welcome back to World News Tonight and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Nearly 170 people, including mayors, businessmen and local administrators, were arrested in a large anti-mafia blitz in Italy and Germany against clan members who control restaurants, garbage collection and funeral services. An Israeli food tech company says it has 3D printed the first ever ready-to-cook fish fillet using an animal cells cultivated and grown in a laboratory. Lab-grown beef and chicken have drawn attention as a way to sidestep the environmental toll of farming and tackle concerns over the animal welfare. But few companies have forayed into seafood. Inflation in the Eurozone stood at 7% in April, up from 6 percent in March, according to a flash estimate published by Eurostat. 
the Statistical Office of European Union. According to Eurostat, energy price inflation in the Eurozone was 2.5% in April year-on-year, year, up from minus 0.9% the previous month. An Argentine police officer was shot after pulling over a car in Buenos Aires. Security camera footage filmed from a gas station showed the policeman pulling over a Volkswagen Vento. A loud shot can be heard and moments later the Vento is seen pulling away. Leaders of Kosovo and Serbia failed to agree on how to lower tensions in Serb-majority areas in North Kosovo. In March, Pristina and Belgrade verbally agreed to implement a Western-backed plan aimed at improving ties, but little progress has been seen since. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And finally, we end off with immersive tourist attractions in Xi'an, which enable visitors to travel through the Tang Dynasty and experience a day in the life of the people from that time. Stay safe and have a good night.